Welcome to another episode of Fully Baked. I'm Sam. Welcome to my kuchnia. Today, we're going to be making the easiest loaf of bread you will ever make. I'm going to show you the equipment we're going to be using and tell you what you can do if you don't have it, what I think is necessary, what I don't think is necessary. So, today, to make our bread, I'm going to be using a scale so that when I separate my two loaves, I get the exact weight. Not necessary. You can do it by feel, by eyeball. If you're going to use a scale, whether it's digital or not, make sure you cover the top before you put the dough on. The other thing we're going to use today that's not particularly necessary, I'm going to use an electric kettle because we're going to use steam within our oven to bake our bread. I have two because my husband's a coffee nerd, so we have the big one and a little bit smaller one. I'm actually going to use these to boil the water. You're able to use a pot, manual kettle, microwave the water, however you want to do it. All right. We're going to need our gen general mixing bowl. We have a second bowl that's going to do double duty. We're going to put a some of the flour in here. Prior to mixing it, I'll explain why as we go, and then this will be our proofing bowl, and we'll explain that as we go. We're actually going to use our microwave if it's a proofing box. If you don't have a microwave or you can't keep it out of commission for a couple hours, you can always just put your bread dough in the warmest spot in your house. We're going to be using our bench scraper again, a thermometer. This is also something you can do without. This you can do without. However, I find that this borders on necessity. You can test the water with your fingers, your wrist, but you can make a mistake. So even if you don't want a nifty, kind of spendy one like this pretty pink one, any good basic temperature, doesn't even have to be digital, so that you can keep your water within the proper temperatures would be good. We're gonna be using our trusty little bowl and our little pastry brush. This isn't necessary, this is an extra step I like to take to make the bread a little extra tasty. What this bread's gonna do is it's gonna rest after we shape it rather than reproof. So I'm gonna use an old, do it the old fashioned way and use a lovely bread towel. You can re-plastic cover it or if you don't have a specific bread towel, a clean, dry linen cloth will do. Got my trusty parchment paper to put the water so we can create steam in our stove. We're going to put a roasting pan in the bottom of our oven underneath the racks. This one is a good old fashioned turkey roaster. You can use a cast iron pan if it's big enough to hold at least about a liter. I usually like to go about two liters of water, two and a half. I have hard water though, so I need to add a little extra water uh, than I would if we didn't. Um, or even a good roasting pan. But make sure that the roasting pan you use in the bottom of your oven can go to temperatures of at least 500. Now, in this particular recipe, we start with a cold oven, so I'm going to go ahead and move my rack to the top level so that I can pour the hot water in when it's time easily, and then I'll move the rack down before we put the bread in. Next is our trusty cooling racks that we've used in the past two recipes and we use pretty much every time. Put those out of the way our sharp knife for scoring our bread. We're gonna need a little bit of cooking spray. We're gonna need a little bit of saran wrap or for covering our dough. We're gonna need our spoons measuring cup. No matter how much water I need, I like to use my four cup measuring cup I actually bloom my yeast right in this. If you don't have a big one, you can take your amount of water, put it in a small bowl, and do exactly what I'm gonna do inside this. 
I like to have a pair of cooking chopsticks. What makes them cooking chopsticks is that they're attached. Not necessary if you don't have chopsticks of any kind. You can go ahead and use butter knives, a spoon, whatever you'd like to. I like to use these just because I have a dry side, a wet side, I don't lose them anywhere. I use one to stir the sugar and yeast into the water to help it dissolve, and one to stir the salt into the flour. I find these, or just anything to stir with a little, something I consider essential. Now with this bread, we can make it into many, many, many shapes. We can make a loaf in a loaf pan. We can make the uh, French and Italian bread you see in just the long sort of oblong loaf with the scores on it. You can make it round. You can cut it into balls and roll it into rolls. You can roll it into a little log and tie it in a knot and make knots. You can actually use this dough for pizza dough. So your choice of pan is unlimited, really. Now, if I was going to do a, a freeform loaf, as I like to call it, I would use my perforated pan because it gets heat and air from both sides. Uh, but if you don't have one of these or don't want to get one, a cookie sheet does the same thing, just a little differently. Now with that perforated pan, I would spray that down with cooking spray so nothing sticked. If you're, sticks, if you're using a cookie sheet, you can throw the parchment down. That works awesome too. If you want a round loaf, you can use a cake pan as long as it's a deep pan because you want enough room for the bread. And, or you could use, if you have a spring form pan, it does make it easy to remove the bread. Gives you a nice little texture on the bottom. You can cut parchment paper to fit the bottom of these. You can spray them down and you'd score the top exactly how we're gonna do it for a loaf. Now you heard me mention loaves. Um, I have loaf pans that look like this. They're a little thinner and a little bit longer. You can use the fatter, shorter one but I'm gonna go ahead and use these today. Now, one loaf of bread is gonna get stored once we get used for dinner tonight. So I have a nice handy bread bag and twist tie to store them in. Uh, tell you how to store them, freeze them, and all that good stuff later. So this is optional, but I will be using it today. Now, next thing we're gonna do is look at our recipe because remember, we always wanna read our recipe first so we know what we're doing, how we're doing it, and what we need. Now, you'll see on the recipe that's down below that it tells you how to do a lighter crust than we're gonna do. I'll give you some tips too um, as we're cooking. It also tells you about cornmeal. And I'm not gonna use it, but I'll tell you that you can. It's especially good if you're making pizza dough or if you're doing your bread freeform on a pizza stone. Um, but you can dust generously a sheet pan with your cornmeal so that your dough doesn't stick um, and you get that like old fashioned sort of cornmeal dust on the bottom. I just don't do it that way. All right, we're gonna need today a tablespoon or one packet of active dry yeast. If you don't wanna skimp on your yeast, you want a decent brand, Red Star works well for me. Uh, Fleischmann's is another popular brand. You can try whatever you can find. This is just the particular one that I like. We're gonna need a tablespoon of regular granulated sugar, and that'll be to feed our yeast. A tablespoon of salt. Now I've got two salts out. I'm gonna salt the top of my bread. Again, that's optional. I just think it gives it really extra flavor. This one is a violet salt, grape infused. I think it tastes really good on bread. Inside the dough, I'm gonna use my Himalayan pink salts. Um, I do care for the flavor that it gives. You can use regular table salts inside your bread if you prefer or if that's what you have. We're gonna need two cups of water and five and a half to six cups of flour. Now, when it comes to flour, y'all, today here, where I am, it's really damp, it's really humid. If you're in a super dry place, it affects how your flour works. 
if your flour has a little more protein, a little less protein, different brands absorb differently. So that's why you're going to see five and a half to six cups. You might need less. You might even need more. For instance, if you add dried herbs to this, dried herbs, dried fruit will suck in moisture. You're going to actually need less flour. So that's also what I was going to say about this bread is really versatile. You can add stuff. It's great. All right, so let's do like we normally do first. Let's pull our ingredients because we need to bloom our yeast. And what that means is we're going to put the warm water between 70 and 110. Under 70 can keep the yeast from blooming. Over 110 can kill your yeast and it'll never go active. So we want between 70 and 110. And then we're going to feed the yeast. We're going to use sugar. You can use a little flour, honey, depending on your recipe, anything that has a sugar to it. However, what we're going to then do is add the yeast and the sugar and the water, dissolve the sugar, stir in the yeast. And then while we get everything else, it's going to do what we call blooming. It'll start to get a little bubbly. The longer you'd leave it, it would almost look marshmallowy on top. And like I said, if you only have a small one of the liquid measure cups, you can go ahead and take your two cups of water, pour it into a small bowl and do it that way. So let me go ahead and get the water running so we can warm up our water. And we're gonna pull out our sugar. We're gonna open our yeast so that we're able to pull these in there as soon as necessary. While the water's warming, I'm gonna pull my thermometer Mine turns on by holding the button down. Once it comes on, it'll be, as you can see, it'll be ready to pop into the water and make sure our water temperature is correct. Now I bet you're thinking, well, what if I just don't have a thermometer? Run that water as it's running in your sink over your pinky when it feels warm, not too hot, warm. Yours should be good. And especially for this one, because we're gonna add the tablespoon of sugar first to dissolve into the water. So if it's too hot, as this is, you'll see this water's around 114 degrees, 113 degrees, and we need it to be 110 or below. So what, as we put this sugar in, it'll help the temperature to cool off as well. Plus it'll give the sugar some time to, di to dissolve fully. So let's put the sugar in, close it back up and take it out of our way. And here comes our chopsticks. We're gonna start by stirring in our sugar, both the stirring of the water as well as to dissolve the sugar. It helps cool the water. So we're just gonna go ahead and keep stirring. Now you'll be able to kind of hear that the sugar's dissolving because you won't hear the granules scraping anymore. And this works the same whether you do it in this cup or in the bowl. I like to use the cup for easy pour, as well as I then go ahead and reutilize this to help make my microwave a proofing box for the rise of the dough. So I'm gonna set these down, we're gonna put the temperature back in, or the thermometer rather, and we still need to drop two degrees, so we're gonna go ahead and set that. In the meantime, I'm gonna measure out my tablespoon of yeast. Now remember we've talked about before that if it's talking about cups and spoons, use cups and spoons. If it starts out with weight, if it tells you 52 ounces of flour, then you figure out 52 ounces of flour and you do everything by measure rather than volume. Just make sure you stick to one medium. Now while we wait for the temperature to come down, we're almost there, we have one more degree to drop. We will be doing our dough by hand, not using a dough hook, not using a machine. 
Even if you have a dough hook, even if you have a machine, do your first breads by hand is my recommendation because then you know what your dough should feel like. You do it a couple times, you get your perfect loaf of bread. You know how your dough should feel. So then when you throw it in the machine with the dough hook or into the bread machine and you pull the dough out, you really know what it should look and feel like. Uh, particularly with the dough hook more than the bread machine, but if you don't know how your dough should feel, if you don't know how it should spring back, if you don't know the feel of the dough, if you throw it in the, the bread hook you, and you just knead, let it knead, you could easily over knead or under knead, which will affect how your bread rises, how dense it is, how fluffy it is. Alrighty, let's check our temperature, still needs another degree. Proofing is when you've created your dough and you set it aside so it rises. In this particular recipe, we want it to double in size. You can, there are people that use their oven as a proofing box, set it on low, turn it off, let it stay, you know, lightly warm. There's YouTube videos to do it that way. I personally never trust it because my oven runs with its own mind. You have to monitor the temperature. If it doesn't cool down, you could really affect how your, or if it gets too cold inside the oven, you could really affect how your dough rises. Like I said, if you don't have a microwave or you can't keep anybody from using it, find the warmest spot in your house, the top of your microwave, a, a room you keep the heat up in, put it safely there, well covered. We're gonna microwave a, measure a cup of water for about two minutes. When it's done, we're gonna take it out, pop the bowl in, shut the door and let it rise in there and you'll have the moisture and the heat the way you would with a commercial proofing box. All right, we have 109 on our thermometer, so we're gonna go ahead and pull that out. Grab a little paper towel, dry off our thermometer. And remember to turn it off so we don't waste the battery. And set it aside for later use, for using once we cooked our bread. We're gonna take our yeast, put it in our cup. We're gonna take the wet side of our top six, and we're gonna go ahead and stir in our yeast. Now, some people go ahead and just sprinkle it over the bowl and just let it bloom from there. I like to stir it in, you don't actually have to. You can literally let it just sit on top and grow. So I'm gonna give it a good stir, and then I'm gonna lay my chopstick down, and we're gonna pull the rest of our ingredients now, unlike when we do cookies or cakes, I'm not actually gonna get my hands ready yet. We'll do that after we get the dough ready since it's gonna take an hour plus to two hours to rise. So let's just set those and our parchment paper out of the way for a moment and pull our ingredients. So in our bowl we're gonna mix with, I'm going to put three, four cups of flour, and then we're gonna put the other flour in the other bowl and we'll use it as needed, more or less. But that's in a clean bowl, so if we don't use it, we can put it back in. So we're gonna go ahead and pull our first four cups of flour. And we're gonna do this the way we've done the flour in the past. We're gonna dump it in. Make sure it's back to the handle. Scrape it off. One cup. Now we're gonna do it the same way every time. Two cups. Three cups. Four. Put the other two cups in the other bowl. Five. And six. I'm just gonna lightly, I'm gonna go ahead and leave the measure cup in there and set that aside. Now, 
The other reason I also like to separate it is if I'm not using as much flour, I can not dump it back in if I put the salt in it. And there is a very good reason why we're putting the salt into flour and mixing it well and not in with the yeast and water. If you add salt directly to your yeast, you will kill your yeast. And that is why we always add the yeast to the flour mixture, uh, dough mixture, never directly into the water with the yeast. There are even recipes that tell you to dump everything in. Do not dump your salt on your yeast. You will kill your yeast. You will not get a bread rise. Now, we need one tablespoon of salt. So we're gonna go ahead and pour that out. We're gonna put it in the flour bowl, which is our mixing one. And then we're gonna use the dry side of our chopsticks. And we're gonna make sure it is well mixed into the flour. And again, that's because we don't want the yeast in direct contact with a pile of salt because again, it'll still kill the yeast that way. So we're gonna make sure it's fully mixed in so that we can go ahead and do the yeast mixture next. Now, we're gonna need right on my countertop. Again, I told you last video, last month, that I use the vinegar and water on my counter so I don't worry about any chemical residue. Um, one of the other things we're gonna use today when I pour my loaves is the back of my big bamboo cutting board. Uh, it'll work like an actual baker's bench because of the wood. It helps you to roll stuff. You can also knead on one of these or a big carving board if it doesn't have the uh, spikes in it or if they have removable ones. Use the back of it because no other food's been on it. If you don't trust your countertop, you can knead on top of that as well. The reason you want to be especially careful with dough as you're going to be kneading, you're going to be pressing down, using a little force. Dough will pick up every, any minute piece of anything that is anywhere. If you have the slightest cut, make sure you have gloves on. Make sure your underneath your nails are clean. If you wear an eye watch or like a Fitbit, make sure you take it off. You can get fine flour into them and ruin them. All right, it's time to pour our yeast in. You can see that it's a little fuzzy and foamy on top. That means your yeast is active. Our water was the right temperature. It was well fed. I'm gonna go ahead and pour that right in. And while I pour that in, I'm gonna go rinse this out. You don't need to do that right away, but I don't like to have that extra yeast smell just floating around in the house. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and start mixing that. And I'm gonna use one hand for right now so I have a clean hand to touch other things with. Now, I like to just go from the under and start bringing the flour in. You can see I'm just sort of what they call almost folding until I get sort of some thickness. And then you can literally just stir with your hand and you'll see that dough is starting to form and it gets a sticky ball. As you can see, it's a little sticky ball starts to get going. Now, if you're like me, you're already wearing dough on your shirt, but there are two options here as we go along. You can continue to knead within your bowl till it really pulls away from the bowl and you don't have to scrape at it to get it loose. And then when, if you do it that way, you really wanna be sure that you're using the most minimal amount of flour while you knead, so that you don't over flour your dough. I, however, just like I did with the dog biscuits, often like to take my dough out of the bowl ahead of that, so that I don't have to worry about how much flour I am using to knead. And you'll notice I poured that flour over my hand that is doughy, which helps pull the dough the wet dough off my fingers and into the dough ball we're forming. 
All right, this is getting to the point where I like to turn it out. You could do some more in the bowl, but I find that it's difficult to really get it mixed well past there in the bowl. You'll see it's starting to really clump into a dough. It's still really sticky. So the first thing we're gonna do is take some flour out and we are going to, if you're only using what you need, you would just sprinkle some dust. I, however, haven't used nearly enough flour that we need, which is my preferred way in that way. You can use what you're using to keep your dough from sticking while you need as more flour for your dough. And then we just get to going. Now, right now, I'm gonna try and get this hand a little clean. I pour some flour on, pull this off. If you don't want all this dough sticking to you and you don't wanna to touch it, just throw some gloves on. I know if you have long nails or if you have nails uh, that you get done at the salon, throw some gloves on because you're never gonna get dough out from under them. And whatever you have under your nails will be in the dough. All right, so. Now we have a pile of dough. It's sort of a loose ball. We're gonna bend it over, push it down. We're gonna use the heel of the hand. You're just gonna go like that. You put your heel down, your hands down like this, using the heel of your hand, and you're gonna push forward. And then you're gonna turn, fold it, push. Turn, push. I often do two pushes per side. And right now I have a very soft dough, which I know is not enough, but that's all right. If you have a bench scraper, you can scrape your countertop or your cutting board before you put more down. If not, it's no big deal. You just use your hand, rub your fingers over, get the dough that's sticking off back on for your loaf. Uh, when you wash your counter, what you're gonna need to do is Scrub it a little harder because the bench scraper does make it clean up a little bit easier and they are pretty inexpensive. Um, you don't have to have a nice metal one. You can get the plastic ones, they work well. And they do bend into the bowl so when you scrape it out of the bowl it is slightly easier to use those. So you're just gonna keep doing this and you're gonna keep rotating. And you rotate and fold so that you're really working the dough. And the reason you're kneading like this is you need to get that gluten build up. You need to get the bread activated so that it rises beautifully. So just fold, hands down, push. I'm going to turn this way. Fold it, put your hands down using the heel of your hand. You see my fingers are here. Push. Don't forget, you can use some of your body weight to go into it if you are even smaller than me in height and your counters are a little tall, you can do it on a kitchen table or stand on a step stool to give you some leverage. Uh, if you have ever made empanadas or tortillas from hand by hand or pasta by hand, same exact kneading process. Just fold and bend. You can do it the one hand, which is my general method with a softer dough. I fold with my right hand, press with my left, rotate with the right and fold, press, rotate and press. You can get a rhythm going and it'll go pretty quickly. And you're thinking to yourself, well, I've never made this bread. I don't know what it should feel like. I'm gonna show you as we go. Again, I'm using more flour because my dough's still not floured enough. It's still super soft. If you press on it, it's just this doesn't really spring back at you. Now, at some point, I'm going to say to you, we're going to rest this dough while I wash my hands and put the stuff in the sink and wipe out this bowl and spray it down. And I'll tell you what I'm doing while I'm doing it. And you're thinking to yourself, I looked at this recipe and it doesn't say rest the dough. Some will tell you to rest the dough. Some won't. I always rest the dough. I always rest the dough because one, it gives your arms a break. Two, it gives the dough a second to settle itself and you can see where you're at. 
Now you see now I'm just sprinkling flour because we're getting pretty close to done here or at least to resting stage. So we don't wanna over flour. You'll find that your dough is starting to be less sticky and you're gonna just wanna round it out a little every now and again. And it'll stop sticking to your counter or your board as much. I like to do it and flip it just a habit. You don't necessarily have to do that. You just have to move it out of the way and sprinkle if you need more flour. Now, as you saw the dough before, it was sort of just a pile. You couldn't really pick it up. It's starting to smooth out, starting to hold its shape. That's a clue you're getting close. And now I put that flour between my hands and rub it like that. It helps keep my hands from being Sticky with the dough so that it doesn't stick to my hands while I knead. Now I, like I said, I like to take it out before it's at a point where you're just kneading, where I'm still adding flour within the knead. And that kind of comes from an old habit of making a well. Again, if you've made pasta, you've probably seen, your, or if your grandmother made, Pasta by hand, you've probably seen this. You make a well of flour, you add your ingredients in the middle, and you pull in flour as needed, both using it for the knead and to build the dough. And this is sort of a hybrid of that. I get a more exact usage of my ingredients and I get them bloomed out a little better, but I also can do that by feel. Now you'll see my dough looks a little smoother. If you press on it, it comes back a little, but it's not real fast, so I'm not ready to stop kneading it. So we go and just roll and fold. And you'll often find if it starts really sticking when the dough's not real sticky, you just have some dough stuck to your counter. And that's where a good bench, bench scraper comes in hand. Candy, you could use the back end of a butter knife. Uh, by the back side, I mean not the side you would normally uh, use the, to butter something with, but the even duller side to help scrape your countertop. All right. So you'll see now when I press, it pops almost right back up. So I'm going to go ahead and rest that dough. This is where for a second our bread towel will come in one of two times. I cover it in case you get a fly in your kitchen, just so nothing falls on it. First thing I'm gonna do is rewash my hands. Now that my hands are good and clean and not covered in dough anymore, we are gonna dump back our flour. And we're gonna go ahead and prep our bowl for using it for our rising bowl. So we're gonna take a paper towel and I'm gonna go over the sink and I'm just gonna wipe this out so any of the flour gets wiped out. Now, that's why we only put the dry ingredient in this bowl. So once you get that wiped clean, and it doesn't have to be super perfect, we're gonna go ahead and spray our baking spray in there so that our dough doesn't stick to the bowl while it's rising. And you don't need a heavy coating, just a light little coating. Go all the way up the sides of the bowl. Just sprayed my own arm. It happens. That's why we keep a napkin handy. And set that aside. 
You're going to want to grab at this point your saran wrap and have it handy because we're going to need that for the top of the bowl. Now, the next thing we're going to do is get our microwave running with our measuring cup full of water. I say around two minutes. If I'm still needing for a full two minutes, we do it the full two minutes. Now, if you don't live alone, you pro or if you're not home alone at the moment, you're gonna wanna hang a sign on the microwave saying do not use, do not open, because you don't want anybody messing up your bread. Now we're gonna go ahead and finish kneading our bread. And that should be done right about, or right before the microwave turns off. And you will feel the difference. You see how easily it is going now that it rested just a little? It gives that gluten in. Now you're gonna to wanna to take your dough and round it for putting in there. And once you get a little round, give it a poke, not quite, it should bounce back at you a little bit. That's how I like to see it. That's how I know I'm ready. You can see how much it's smoothing out. And I'll hold up close to you when we're done here and show it to you. Just about done. Little bitch. I'm gonna go ahead and give it the last run through. Give it a good rounding. You can see just how much smoother the dough is than it was before. It's pretty well holds its shape while you're holding it. But we need just a little bit more. It's not quite where we want it. And it depends on your weather, how much flour you're gonna need. It depends on your weather, how quickly I get it to knead in. Now we got a nice round ball. Give it a poke, it bounces back at me. So you can see it's nice and smooth. Gives it a good poke back, it bounced right out. So we're gonna take it, drop it in, turn it over. Then we're gonna go over to our microwave, dump out the water, be careful, the water will be very, very hot. I'm gonna close the microwave so I don't lose any of that lovely heat and warmth in there. We're gonna take our saran wrap, cover the top of your bowl exactly how you want it, separate it. Get your cooking spray. Again, if you're, it rises to the top of the bowl, you're gonna to wanna to Make sure your spray is on your saran wrap. Then very gently, taking the corners, lift the saran wrap. I found if I move slow, it doesn't curl up on me. Turn it over, put it on. You want a bowl big enough for your dough to double in bulk. Put it in your microwave and leave it alone. This recipe says about one to two hours. You want it about doubled. I'm gonna set my timer for an hour to check it. And then if it's not doubled, we'll go from there. But it's gonna depend on the weather, depend on the dough, depend on your room. 
your best guess is going to be till doubled in bulk. But you don't want to open your microwave too often, so we know it's between one and two hours. I'll check it at an hour. Um, if I have time to, like if it's, if it's one where you punch it down, and by punch it down, that just means you give it a quick push down to press out gas. You can re-humidify your microwave with a little bit of water, about 30 seconds to a minute. This one's not like that, so we'll just check it. If it's not double, just shut the door and let it go. Now we're going to scrape this off. And before I get to washing everything, I'm going to go ahead and get my pan set up. We're going to take our parchment paper and I'm going to put it in this way. So I'm not going to cut much of this off. I'm not even really going to measure that because I'm doing a loaf pan. Uh, if you just want it on the inside, you would take a pen, draw all the way around, cut it out, and then make sure you put the side that you drew on face down so it's not touching the food. But I would actually like it to go this way. And I don't even know that I need to cut anything. Let's see what happens here. I'm just actually going to cut a sliver off the side so that it sits evenly for me. This one I'm eyeballing because... I just want it to fit in. I don't need it to be perfect. All right. There we go. Now I'm going to take my cooking spray. And I'm going to spray the whole inside of my pan. Then we're going to take our parchment paper. I'm going to go ahead and set it down in there. And use that cooking spray to stick it to the bottom. You can pull it up if you don't get it quite right. Now, because I'm using loaf pans, I've left them, as you see, hanging on the sides. That, when I get it out of the oven, I can lift the bread right by these. Now, we're just going to do the same thing with the second pan. parchment paper especially for bread but I do that right before I put the dough in or right before I uh, get ready to put the dough in because I don't want it to be too greasy in there and we just set those aside and they can be set down on the stove because they're not gonna be worried about heating up if it was a recipe where we preheat, but in this case, we actually don't preheat. We start with a cold oven and boiling water, so it won't make any difference what's sitting on your stove today. All right. I will be back with you in approximately an hour or two, and we'll get moving with our dough. All right, we're back. As you can see, we fully doubled in bulk, so we're gonna do a punch down. Now I'm going to very carefully remove this plastic and set it down because I'm going to reuse it on the scale so that we don't have to waste any extra plastic. Now to punch down dough, you just literally use your fist, punch it down to take out the gas. And then we're going to, instead of dumping it right out on our board, I'm going to go ahead and get the scale ready because I want two equal chunks of bread. So let me get this out. Put our little piece of plastic on it, making sure we put the side with the cooking spray facing up. We'll get our dough, give it a quick way. All right. Just about two pounds, 12 ounces. So about 18, about a pound three. 
down six, her. Move this out of the way. Dump this on my cut board. Now we'll get our bench scraper, kind of eyeball half of it, give it a cut, and weigh it. Just about even, so we're going to call that good. I'm going to drop that down there and throw this plastic back over it while I work with this one. Turn off our scale. Now you may or may not need any flour at this point to do the forming, but what we're going to do is shape our dough and get it into our pans. I'm going to add a little spray in there. Like I said, I'm going to spray the paper too. I just didn't want to do it ahead of ourselves. Make sure we get a good fold on there. Now, if you are making it round, just form it into a round ball. If you want to make like the Italian loaf, you're just going to lay it out, do the seam, what I'm going to do, but you're just going to stretch it a little more and do your scoring and have it on the sheet pan. I want to go ahead and make loaves today, so I'm going to go ahead and take my bread, give it a little push, bring the over, bring it over giving it a seam, I'm giving it a basic seam. I'm gonna kind of tuck my ends just a little. It's literally that simple to make it for the loaf pan. Now there are plenty of other things you can make with this particular bread dough. See, and then you just lay it seam side down into here. We're gonna do it again. But if you wanna make rolls, all you need to do is cut, depending on how big you want your rolls, one to two ounce pieces of dough. If your hands are big enough, just put the dough down, round them into a roll, not cup it in your hand, do it like a meatball. You can take it and roll it into a small log and literally tie it in a knot to, and then use garlic butter after it's done cooking to have garlic knots. You can do little mini braided loaves. You could braid it. You could roll it out for pizza dough. You can just cut smaller pieces and make small little, almost like a hoagie roll, but a little heartier, like a deli roll. But like I said, you can't, this, you can do so many different things with this. You don't, you're not limited with this dough. All right, so we're gonna do again, our little shaping. We're gonna take it, flatten it out a little to the shape we want. Now, if you're rolling this out for some reason, and you start rolling, and as you're trying to shape it, it bounces back on you, let it rest a few minutes, then go back to it. So once I get this, and that's the length I want it, remember we're gonna fold in, fold in, giving ourselves a seam. Tuck our ends a little. And we're going to make sure we put the seam side down. Give that a little zhuzh in there so that I get a more equal loaf of bread. As that was a slightly smaller piece. Alright, now that we have our dough in our bread pans, we rest them for five minutes. And this is called bench resting, which is how you may see it in some recipes. Reason it's called bench resting is the baker's table, the wooden baker's table, it was, was and is called a bench. For bench resting, you can use the plastic wrap over it again, and I suggest you try and save it so you don't have to use too much, uh, or a clean, dry linen towel. I have bread towels here, so I'm gonna go ahead and cover that. During this five minutes, what we're going to do is get this bread out of the way. We are going to get our water boiling, and we're gonna get our knife for scoring, and we're gonna get a little water also to sprinkle our salt on. 
So let's go ahead and fill our tea kettles or if you're using a pot, fill your pot. If you're using the microwave, fill your first cups with it. Um, if you're not using a tea kettle, I suggest doing it with a pot so that you can get a larger amount of water at one time. Now some of uh, the recipes call for the cold water going into a hot oven. And you need to be very careful when you do that because you could burn yourself on the rack. What I do when I have to put cold water into a hot oven is I go ahead and put the rack again on the very top level so that I can carefully pour the water into the hot oven and then use two good pot holders to move the rack back down where it belongs. Uh, if you think you can pour it in without touching your arm to the rack, you can go ahead and try that. I don't like to do that because I'd rather not burn myself. All right, so we're gonna get this water boiling. Like I said, I like about two to three liters on mine because I have hard water. So with the mineral evapor evaporation and everything, I like to have a little extra water in there. All right, the next thing we're gonna go ahead and do is get a little water in our dish. And that will be so that when I do the salting on top, that it sticks. Uh, it'll also help give me a little bit of a crustier crust. I like a little thicker crust. Uh, there's another way you can get a little bit thicker crust with a lot of your doughs. What you can do is go ahead and leave them in the oven to cool, meaning when you shut the oven off, instead of taking them out of the oven and taking them out of the pan and putting them on the rack, you can just crack your oven and leave it like this until it fully cools and that will give you a crust your crust. All right, now, once this is done resting for five minutes, we've got about four minutes left, we're gonna score it. Now, there are several ways that you can score your bread. The, the easiest way is with a sharp knife. I had to run and get a little something to show you. You can also use the, a baker's lame, which is basically a sharp razor on a stick. And depending on which angle and which side, and which way you cut gives you various different types of scoring. It works great. I like it. I've used it. I don't particularly enjoy changing the blade, however. So I often don't use it. Um, if I forgot to sharpen my knife before I do bread, I'll pull this out. Or if I'm doing something fancy and I want to get a good design on there, I'll often use this. But if you're just scoring, a good sharp knife will do the trick. Score, you do scoring so that when you put your uh, bread in the oven and it starts to rise, it doesn't split wide open and rip from the steam escaping, the moisture escaping the bread. But you're not cutting into your bread. You're gonna take the sh a very sharp knife, position it, cut down, just go straight down, come straight out, or on an angle, depending on what type of score you want, but you're not cutting. When we go to cut our bread later, we are gonna use a special knife for that as well. I'll go ahead and pull that to show it to you now while our water is boiling. We're going to use a bread knife when I slice it to show you the inside. And what makes it a bread knife is the squared off end. So that we can get into the bread, slice it down, get a beautiful slice without tearing up the bread. It is a lightly serrated knife with a square tip. They come in most uh, knife sets you get at like Walmart or Ross. You don't need, it, 
you don't need anything fancy, any fancy kind. This came with a knife set, I think, from Ross. So let me set that aside for later. Now there's gonna be two ways to tell if our bread is done when it comes out of the oven. If you have a thermometer, you can insert it into the bread and make sure that it reads 190 degrees. If you don't have a thermometer, there are other ways to do this, particularly the tap, where you tap the back of the bread and it thumps and sounds hollow, which we'll do when the bread comes out. And when you do that, when it sounds hollow, it means all the moisture has come out of the bread. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and score our bread now. So you're gonna just take the knife, push down, make a nice cut, and you'll be able to see the line in the bread. Now I'm going to do two side cuts. On that one, and on this one, what I'm going to do is just give me one right down the center. I'm gonna extend it so I have a nice long slit. And that's it. That is all that they mean when they say score your bread. All right, our water's boiling. So we're very gonna very, very carefully pour this into the roasting pan we have in the bottom of the oven. Okay, and then we're gonna take our other one that is now boiling as well. And we again are going to very carefully pour this into our roasting pan. Now, because this is a cold oven, we're just going to take our rack by hand, get it on the middle. We're going to take our bread, put them in, because again, we start with a cold oven on this recipe. Now, let me just double check my temperature. And we are going to put this on for 400 degrees. So let's see, 400. And then it says for 35 to 45 minutes. So I'm gonna set it at its lowest timer and check it. All right, I'll get back to you when we have some bread to show you. Okay, we're having one of those days and this is how we can fix this. I completely forgot that I wanted to water the top of these and salt them. So since it's barely been in the oven, I'm gonna whip it out, grab my pastry brush, lightly top it with water. If you don't have a pastry brush, you can just take some water on your fingers and literally sprinkle it like that. And then we're gonna quickly salt this. Like I said, this step of putting the water on and then salting, or just putting the water on to get a, a nicer crust, it is completely 100% optional. It's not needed to get such a beautiful loaf of bread. It's just my preferred. And there you go. When you forget something little that is correctable, don't panic. You can most always fix it. If it had been 10 or 15 minutes before I remembered that I didn't salt it and put the water on top for this recipe, it wouldn't have mattered. I wouldn't have just, I would have just not done it. All right, I'll get back to you when the bread comes out. All right, I've pulled the bread from the oven. Now we're gonna make sure it's done and I'm gonna show you both methods to test it. All right, if you have a thermometer and you wanna test it with your thermometer, You just take your thermometer, insert it in, and you want it to read at least 190 degrees. As you can see, that's well done. So I'm gonna pull my thermometer, turn it off because I always forget. The other way is you turn your bread over Give it a good thump. Hear that hollow sound? 
That means that all the moisture has come out of this bread and it is done cooking. If you don't hear a good hollow thump, then it may still need a few more minutes. I'm gonna go ahead and pull that. Now we're gonna put them out and let them cool. Now, remember I said I left these guys down the side to make it easy to pull this out of this type of pan. Voila. All right. I will come back to you as soon as these are cool enough to slice one, and then we will package the other one up. Okay, we're gonna slice into this now, and I'll show you what it looks like. Now remember when you're looking at this, this isn't your typical white bread, like a farmer's loaf, uh, like sandwich bread. This is a heartier, more artisan bread. Uh, there are recipes for a fluffy white bread. They're really good. They're just a little more difficult to make and not as versatile as this recipe. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and show you what we've got inside. You'll see that there's not too many holes. It's not like you've I'm sure everybody's had where you get that little loaf of French bread, you cut into it, and you're left with just the crust because there's so much holes inside. But you also want to be able to see some because you want to know it's nice and fluffy. You'll tell that it's a good fluffy texture. Press it. See how it bounces right back? It doesn't stay in, and it doesn't resist my finger pushing it. That's how you know you got your dough right. And it doesn't matter if you're doing the main dough or just a slice, it should have the same reaction. All right, now, I'm gonna actually be packaging this to pop into the fridge. Remember, we're making bread that has no preservatives, so it won't last quite as long as something you buy from the store. I'll leave it out wrapped in, in a bread bag or plastic wrap if you don't have a bread bag couple days tops and I throw it in the fridge. If you throw it in the fridge, it's a little hard. Slice off your piece, pop it in the microwave five, 10 seconds. Just do them five at a time. Get a nice soft piece of bread or you can warm it if you actually want a warm piece of bread. Or cut it off, throw it in the toaster. Uh, if you wanna use it with dinner, you can, if you're just gonna use a whole loaf, say you're having you know, family with, with soup, you can slice the whole loaf in half Throw it in the oven for a few minutes till it warms up. It'll revive the loaf that's been in the fridge. If you make two loaves, but you know you're not gonna eat them in time, you can very securely wrap your loaf in saran wrap. I personally would then cover it with tin foil as well. Throw it in the freezer. Pull it out when the night before you're ready to use it. Let it thaw in the fridge or a day before you're gonna use it so it has a full 24 hours. Let it thaw out fully. I would thaw it in the fridge. You revive it the same way you would one that's been sitting in the fridge. Warm it in the microwave, warm it in the oven. Works great. These also make lovely garlic breads. But if you're gonna package it in a bread bag, you just drop it in. Twist tie it. I'm not going to twist tie this yet because it's not quite cool enough to close up. And you would just twist the twist tie, you know, push the air out, twist the twist tie on, just like you would get it at the store. That, however, would not be good enough for freezing. Like I said, if you're going to freeze it, you're going to want to make sure that you go ahead and wrap it securely in saran wrap. Okay? Now, as in prior videos, all the new products I use will be listed down below along with the full recipe. If you have any questions, please drop them in the comments. I'll get to you as soon as possible. If you make the bread, drop a picture in the comments. Let's see how, you, how it looks. Also, if you have any requests for something specific you'd like to see made or you'd like to learn how to make, drop it in the comments. We'll see what we can do. Next month, we're gonna do the basic cake. It's a yellow cake that can be made as a yellow cake or a white cake. 
it's a base flavor. I mean, it's just basically as vanilla as you make it if you don't add any other flavoring. It's the base cake. You can make lemon, strawberry, orange cake out of it or white to make, quote, wedding cake. You can make it almond flavor. You can make it straight vanilla. It's literally the base cake. It's also a good cake to learn how to properly mix a cake before we do anything a little more difficult. So again, coming up next month, basic yellow cake. All right, now if you have any questions, comments, or you wanna follow, you can find me at on Twitter and Instagram at at Sam Kist, S-A-M-K-I-S-T, all one word. Or you can just check the FTF Media website and that'll be it for this, this month. Hope you enjoy your bread. And I just want to once again thank Haley and Mark and FTF Media at FTF Media for giving me a place to put up my videos. See you next month.